Wellspring Ministries presents Streams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stover. This dynamic Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through the anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and the joys of a fulfilling and abundant Spirit-filled and Spirit-led life. I, start, I started uh, when was Sunday night talking about prayer and, and prom the promises and how, how connected they are. Maybe I'll just talk about that a little more tonight because it's the, 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 the confidence we have in our prayer life is in the promises of God. Everything is based on the Word of God. It just, it, it's heartbreaking to me today to, to see various Christian quote-unquote leaders and, and in the music field and uh, various areas, and, and they're, they're deciding that the Bible really isn't true in its totality. And once, once you go to start down that road, it's a slippery slide to destruction. God cannot lie. That's right. He's not a man that he should lie. His word is truth, and it's eternally established. It, it's going to, he, he said that he, he's, he actually sets it higher than his name, his word, and that it's eternal. The word is going to last past even this earth. Yeah, it's just, the word is going to stand. So we've, we've, got, we've got to be bold enough, brave enough, smart enough, I think, to just stand on the word of God. Whether, you know, whether science so-called seems to fly in the face of it or not, because I, I firmly believe that eventually, if we'll just hang to the word, you'll find science coming in again, proving again and again and again that the word is absolutely true. And that doesn't mean that we might, we not, might have to adjust a little bit of our understanding of what certain verses mean and things, and yet it's, it, it does not contradict itself. I've, I've always believed that if there's a contradiction, if I see what I think is a contradiction, what it simply means is I don't understand it. I need to study it more because the Bible will clear itself up. And when we're, when we're looking at the, at, at the promises in the Bible, we've got to believe that, that God who cannot lie will back every promise. And that's what gives us our faith when we pray. If we, if we, if we're not, that's what really what empowers prayer is. What does, what am I, what am I just praying? Well, we do a lot of that, I think, because there's personal things and this and that. But everything should hinge to a promise in the book. If we're praying for healing, there's a promise in the book. If we're praying for finances, there's promises in the book. If we're praying for relationships, there's promises in the book. And so that gives us our fearless confidence and allows us then to say, I'm, I don't have blind faith. I'm not just praying what I, what I think. I'm not just praying, hopefully. I, I'm praying based upon the promises of God. Therefore, I expect to get an answer. Amen. Amen? So, you know, and, and there's the, these promises are, it, it says they are exceeding precious, exceeding great and precious promises. Great value, great reach. All of our expert, expectations in prayer are upon the ground of the Word of God. And, and that, that's so different from uh, blind faith. I've, I've talked to Mormon missionaries, and, and when you really get down to 
well, but do you have any proof that there were these tribes you're talking about in the Book of Mormon, all this? Well, no, but we, we just have faith. That's blind faith. If you can't put a shovel in the ground and come up with something, <laughs> that's blind faith. And, and we, but we don't have that. We have the Word of God that's absolutely solid. And I thank God for that. Exceeding great, precious, glorious, breathtaking, filled with hope, promises. And, and it's on that basis that we pray. And yet a lot of people will, will never, ever experience the brightness, the clarity, the, the bloom, the fruit, you know, because of prayerlessness. I, if I'm not getting where I, I believe God wants me to go, I can't blame God. I've got to turn around and say, well, am I really spending enough time with him to get my directions for the next step? And so, I think I've found myself here. You know, so, so what do you do? You, you change. You spend more time in prayer. And what happens? The minute you do, God comes and he meets you and everything begins to clear. Everything begins to straighten out. It's real easy. We're, we can get so, we know what we're doing and we do it. And we forget that he really wants to be involved in everything. All right? And the best position for you and I to be in is to be standing on his feet. And holding his hands. Hold his hand, stand on his feet. You know, there, there's nothing like, usually little, little girls, they love that. You get on daddy's feet, hold their hands, and they can dance. <laughs> right? Or make giant steps or whatever. And that's, that is a position we're supposed to come as little children. And we've got to be careful we don't get to feeling sufficient in and of ourselves. But as we as we move into prayer, and, and the, the power of, of uh, the prayer of agreement can't be, I mean, you, can't, oh, you, you just can't overstate its value. Because if one puts to fight 1,000, two, 10,000. If two or three shall agree t as touching anything, God will do it. And so th this, this is something that uh, I believe we really need we really need to work on, and, and we're doing that. A, a prayerless church is never going to realize the thousandfold increase, which, which is in the book. It's one of the promises. I'll make you a thousand times more than you are. Okay. So 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 to find where that that place is, where you balance your prayer with your action, and that your actions. Are, are all issuing out of your prayer life, which are based upon promises, so you have confidence when you move forward. That makes sense? Hmm. Prayer makes a way for and brings into practical realization the promises of God. The, the two are inseparable. It, it just, you, 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 prayer without the promises is really impotent. The promises without prayer to activate them, to, to draw upon them, to appropriate them, is also fruitless. It ta it's like both, both uh, oars in the water. God's promises cover everything that, that pertains to life and godliness. In, in 2 Peter for, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, For his divine power, Amplified Bible, has bestowed upon us all things, that are requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellence or virtue. God's promises have to do with spirit, soul, and body. God's promises have to do with time and eternity. And the promises bless the present and then stretch out their blessed giftings to a limitless eternal uh, uh, a future. Prayer holds the promises in, in, in keeping or, or in store, if you will, until the perfect time for fruition. And there again, we, we should never get tired or weary in our prayer life because things don't happen on the time schedule we think they should happen. 
That's my, my biggest frustration has always been God's clock and mine are not synchronized. <laughs> I mean, really, I want, I want it now, you know, <laughs> if I, I ask, ask for it now, I want it now, right? And it doesn't always quite work out that way. Uh, I'm sure uh, Jesus experienced a certain amount of frustration knowing who he was from his bar mitzvah on. He's a man. And yet, he, he also knows he's got to wait until he's 30, because that's, that's when his priesthood work would begin. And I don't know if he knew he was only going to have three, three and a half years to accomplish everything, but you can imagine communing with the Father, knowing what's in front of you, but waiting and waiting but waiting with tremendous hope and expectation, knowing that once he, was, once he moved into his ministry, it might not have, have been, been a long period of time, but it absolutely changed everything. And many times that's exactly where we're at. We, we press. We stay faithful. We look forward. We know what God wants, but we don't have the timing. Okay. And if you quit even a minute before the time, you miss it. Because God comes in his moeds or his appointed times, his suddenlies. We don't think it's so suddenly because we've been waiting, we've been praying, we've been expecting, we've been believing. And yet in that struggle, even, there is a strengthening. And we can continue to do that because of the promises. They're, they're keeping everything in store until the perfect time. Promises are God's golden fruit to be plucked by the hand of prayer. It, I, 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 watch, I watch fruit trees as they begin to develop. And I love peaches. I love Apples. I love strawberries, for that matter. I, there's you know, all that, and yet you can't, you, you cannot, you can't eat them. You can't uh, get any real value out of them. You can't enjoy them until they're ripe, and that means it takes time. And there's a there's a timing in fruitfulness that prayer just hangs on to. Because the promises are sure. The promises are incorruptible seed to be sown and tilled and harvested by prayer. But that's why it takes time. Prayer and promises, independent, like I said. They're like two oars. They have to work together. They're dependent upon each other. You get One's no good without the other. The promise is like the former and latter rain falling, and prayer is the wind that moves the cloud over the place where the rain's supposed to fall. And, and I think that, that is the essence of, of the prophetic, too, right? You, you, you call for rain, and you see nothing in the sky, like the prophet, nothing in the sky. Keeps sending his his understudy out and says, is there a cloud? No, there's no cloud. Well, go look again. Okay, there's no cloud. Go look again. He's praying. No cloud. And he says, go look again. Well, now there's a cloud the size of a man's hand. He's, and then, hey, he gets all excited, and he said, okay, you better, king, you better get moving. It's going to rain. I can hear by the Spirit the sound of an abundance of rain, and we better get to moving. And that's when the supernatural hit him. And he was able to actually outrun a chariot. Let the rain fall. Can you say amen? Let the rain fall. I'm ready for rain. I'm, I'm really ready for rain. I see the cloud the size of a man's hand, and I'm calling to it to come because I want a gully. Do you know it rained, what was it, 18 inches in Florida? Huh? 18.9. 18. Oh, good grief. Can you imagine? In 24 hours. In 24 hours? Florida. No wonder they're flooding. I say, let that happen in the spirit. Yeah. Let that happen in the spirit. 
Let, let's pray and believe that will happen in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Because I, I still, I was listening to, I think I mentioned this before, I was listening to uh, Heidi Baker the other night, one of her meetings at the Toronto airport, and she said uh, what I've been saying all along. There is a huge harvest coming. Billy Graham's still alive. I'm still looking at that. I've, I've, we're, I think we're right on time. We, we may not feel like it, but we are. But there's a great harvest coming. And she put a number to it that I'd never... And she said the, the Lord told her a billion souls. Well, I don't know about that. The Lord told her that. Didn't tell me that. But I know it's going to be huge. And I just want to be ready. Well, how do you be ready? You prepare you stay faithful. You're here. And when they come, you take care of them. And I believe they're going to come. We're praying for them. We're believing for them. And I don't know how long the filth and the perversion and the things that are going on can keep going on. I know that the cup of iniquity can get filled up. I know that God has to judge the kind of sin that's going on in our world today. It's really... In the natural, it's very scary. But in the spirit, there's a place where people, every time, if you look at church history, every time that we move from morality into the cesspool of sin and destruction, deprivation, there was a revival. People got so, they found out that all of the things they were doing was not satisfying, was destroying their lives, and the Spirit of the Lord came in and they just were open to yield to the Spirit of God. And they had great revivals in, in countries, whole nations, uh, our country. Uh, it's always been the same thing. And so to me, <laughs> we're really ripe, we're ready, and we need to pray it in because that's the promise of God. He says, ask of me, I will give you the heathen. I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. Hallelujah. And so we claim them, and we thank God for them, because it's a promise that we can, we can pray with faith, believing. The promise inspires and energizes the prayer, and the prayer locates the promise, and that's what gives it realization. Prayer takes hold of the promise, conducts it to its marvelous ends, removes the obstacles, makes a highway for the promise to its glorious fulfillment. You know, we, we sing the song, uh, prepare ye the way, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Well, it, prayer prepares the way for the promise, the promised one and his promises. And, and while God's promises are exceeding great and precious, they're also very specific, they're very clear, and they're very personal. For example, how pointed and plain was God's pl promise to Abraham in Genesis 22, 15 through 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from, from heaven a second time and said, I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that since you have done this and have not withheld from me or begrudged giving me your son, your only son, in blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply you. I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens, like the sand of the seashore. Your seed, your heir, will possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed, Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and by him bless themselves, because you have heard and obeyed my voice. And... Uh, I appreciate what the Amplified Bible is saying there too, but he's also the in, in Christ, not only shall the natural seed, Israel, and the seed of Christ, the church, uh, uh, they will both are going to be a blessing to the earth and have been. His promise, the promise has come to pass. God has, God has the, the, uh, the church, the stars of the heavens, if you can count them, and he has this, the, the Jews, the, the sand of the sea. And he's, they're both covenant people. Hallelujah. De entirely different in the way he's working with each of, the, each of us, and yet we're a blessing to the world. Okay? 
We, it, it's absolutely amazing. Rebecca, through whom the promise is to flow, is childless. Her barren womb forms an invincible obstacle to the fulfillment of God's promise until in the course of time, and there it is, that, that timing again, children are born to her. Isaac, her husband, becomes a man of prayer through whom the promise is realized. And so then in Genesis 25, 21, Isaac prayed much to the Lord for his wife because she was unable to bear children. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebecca, his wife, became pregnant. See, I, I believe that it, as we pray, according to the Word of God, that there is absolutely nothing impossible. That God will hear and he will heed, and he will answer. Will we be there? Will we wait for the answer? That's, that's the only hard part. I can do anything suddenly, quickly. I love things that just move, and it, it, everything is going, just flowing along. It's all great. Everything's happening. You pray, you get an answer. I love that kind of stuff. I love miracles. I'm not real big on healing. Healing's a process. It takes time. I'd rather have a miracle, wouldn't you? Same way, when I pray, I'd like it to happen. I'm waiting for my million-dollar check every day. I look in the, we look in the mailbox and we say, is it there? Is it there? Is it there? <laughs> well, you know, I'm tired of waiting, but I'll wait because I believe God promised it. Glory to God. <laughs> Isaac's praying opened the way for the fulfillment of God's promise, carried it on to its marvelous fulfillment, made the promise effectual in bringing forth marvelous results. Prayer. Changing the natural order. Changing the natural order. We can't look at, at what is going on, what we can see, we have to look at what we cannot see, which is Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is, to appropriate what we see in heaven. We're told to set our affection on things above. Because that's where, that's where the final decision is made. That's where the answers are. That's where the promises abide in the heart of God who cannot lie. And so we, we, we look around us, we look at the circumstances, we look at the situations, and we go to God and we say, what can I do to change it? And if he doesn't tell us anything, guess what? He's the only one who can. If he shows us what to do, then we can take action, move ahead. It's like nobody's going to get saved unless we go talk to them. It's just that simple. Right? So we can pray all we want for souls, but if we don't go, go talk to people about getting born again, accepting Jesus, it's never going to happen. And yet we can go and we can do that with confidence and with boldness because God has said, all you have to do is just ask of me and I'll give, you, I'll give them to you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God spoke to Jacob, made definite promises to him. Then the Lord said in Genesis 31, 3, the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your people. I will be with you. I like that. I will be with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jacob moves on the promise of God. Esau confronts him with the murderous intent, awakened vengeance after many years of waiting. I mean, Esau is going to kill him. But he's got, he's got a promise from God. So in Genesis 32, 24 through 28, Jacob throws himself directly on God's promise by what? A night of prayer. First in quiet and calmness, and then when the stillness, the loneliness, and the darkness of night became too much for him, he makes this all-night wrestling prayer. That must have been a night. Whew! To see, God's being is involved. His promise is at stake. And there's much involved in the issue. And you've got Esau's temper and his conduct and his character are involved. And it's, it's a huge kind of a situation. And so much depends on it 
But Jacob pursues his case with God, presses his plea with great struggles, hard wrestling, and it, it's the highest form of importunity. Luke 11, uh, 5 through 10, I tell you, although he will not get up and supply him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his shameless persistence and insistence or his importunity, he will get up and he'll give him as much as he needs. If, if someone that really doesn't want to be bothered with you will yield to you if you're persistent, how much more God, who is a loving father, if he knows we're serious about what we're asking. And I guess that's, that's our, always our question. Are we really serious about what we're doing? Victory's gained as the dawn breaks. His name and nature are changed. I love name changes. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's a, he's a new and entirely different man. And then when he confronts Esau, Esau's got a whole change of heart. How'd that happen? It's amazing, really, what God will do. It's like the building department. They say, no, you can't do that. You've already done it too many times. It's never going to happen. Uh, and we go, okay. And then God just gives one little idea, and boop, 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 there it is. Said, oh, yeah, okay. This is the last one, though. This is the last one. Okay, whatever. This is, this is the last one. Well, it may be the last one, the only one we need. <laughs> so the hater, the avenger, he meets his brother, you see, in, in the bonds of love. What happened? Whole change of, of attitude. Everything changes. Fear and hate are dissolved in brotherly affection. Hallelujah. Love never fails, does it? As we pray, no wonder God says, pray for those that despitefully use you and you know, talk bad about you and all that stuff. Pray for them. Bless them. But why? Because you can actually change their whole nature. One touch from the finger of God changes everything. Your enemies become your friends. That's scary. It's wonderful. I, I remember back when Sharon was working for the county. I mean, not everybody was real happy about the position she was in and the authority she had, all that kind of stuff. And yet God, when all, all was said and done, God had those same people coming to her for prayer and, and coming to her for counseling. They became her friends. Isn't that something? Persistent prayer prevails. Elijah defeated the priests of Baal, and after a long drought, now there needed to be rain. In 1 Kings 18.1, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I'll send rain on the earth. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. And I mentioned that uh, before bowed himself on the earth, put his face between his knees. I think that's interesting because he wasn't looking at the situation, the circumstance. He was focusing on God, focusing on the promise. And somebody else looked for him, but he was focusing on the promise. He said to his servant, go up. And look. But Elijah kept saying, go again. Well, how many times? Seven times. Well, how many times are we going to go look? Well, let's, how about it, as many times as it takes until we see it, until we have it? Because faith, faith gives us substance. Hallelujah. Persistent prayer and faith brought rain. I believe persistent <laughs> prayer and faith will bring finances. I believe persistent prayer in faith will bring laborers for the harvest, people. I believe persistent prayer in faith will just change everything. Hallelujah. People who don't want to hear truth will have ears yearning to hear the truth. 
things are going to change, in other words. Public opinion may not change, and yet a lot of public opinion will change because it will yield to prayer. I remember stories of um, various evangelists, and before they would go into a city, they, they had someone that would go and pray. Be, huh? Yeah. And they'd go in weeks ahead of time and just pray. And when the evangelist showed up, it was like people were just waiting to get saved. I believe that's what we're coming to. We're praying for the lost. I know we are. We're, we're praying for souls, for disciples. We're praying for rain, the former and latter rain together. And I, I cannot but believe we're going to receive it. We're going to see it. It's promised to us. Praise God. Both in the word of God as it's written and in the prophetic promise of God. Yes, Elijah prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. So did Jesus. But he received the promise, didn't he? Which was you and I. The greater the need, the greater the prayer should be. To get, what, passionate, to get fervent, to get the effectual fervent prayer. So it's not a feeble, half-hearted, well, I hope this works. Those kind of prayers will not bring the promises of God into fruition. It won't, it, it won't give the power needed for them to bloom to mature, to develop, only divine praying. And that's where we need the Holy Spirit. When we run out of ourselves to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us, with us, to help us to pray when we know not how to pray, to carry out the divine purpose. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah.